Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. Take up his cross and follow me. To deny myself simply means that I am no longer on the throne of my own life. Now Jesus is ruling and reigning, not just philosophically, but in reality. It means I've given him the reins and the throne of my life. Pastor Sam's message, The Cross, only covers four verses, but within them, there's a lot to talk about. The idea of denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following Jesus can be a hard thing to wrap our heads around. So let's listen in as Pastor Sam breaks this down and helps us understand. Let's turn in our Bibles then to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. We pick up today at verse 24, the title of our message, The Cross. Matthew 16 verses 24 through 28 and if you'd read along with me Jesus said to his disciples if anyone desires to come after him let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me for whoever desires to save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it for what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, the historical context of these statements of our Lord, as challenging as they are, well, it takes us back to Peter's confession of who Jesus is and Jesus' explanation of what that meant. If you weren't here at our last study, I do recommend you pick up the tape. It's not always necessary. In this case, it will be helpful to you. In any case, let me give you the very brief foundation that will help all of this come into focus. Jesus had asked, who do men say that I am? The responses were, well, they were the responses that people make today. Well, a great prophet, a great teacher, a miracle worker and such. But he said, well, who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The ultimate question in life, and that is, who does the father say Jesus is? And Jesus declares to Peter, having blurted out, you're the Christ, you're the son of God. Well, he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. The father says Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And it's interesting that he was able to say it to and through Peter. Now, some have elevated Peter a bit further than I think he belongs in scripture and tradition, but others, well, we sort of diss him a bit. You know, we, we, we talk about him, well, he, you know, to ask the Lord, hey, if it's you, tell me and I'll come and walk on the water to you. And, and of course, Peter gets out of the boat. He walks toward Jesus on the water and out there on the water. He takes his eyes off the Lord, begins to sink, cries out, help, Lord. And of course he does. And we look and say, faith faltered. But I'm wondering about the 11 that were, didn't even have enough faith to get out of the boat. You see, Peter was a man of faith and passion. And he was a man who had a receptiveness to the Spirit of God. Because when the Father spoke to him, well, I don't know if Peter even knew it was the Father. All he knew is he had a revelation. And it turns out the revelation was from heaven. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then there was a temptation and a revelation from hell. As Jesus began to tell his disciples what it meant and what it means that he's the Christ and the son of the living God, that he had to go up to Jerusalem, be handed over to the chief priest, be crucified, but he'd rise again the third day. Peter gets in Jesus' face and he says, far be it from you, this will never happen to you, Lord. And we made mention of the fact that there are a lot of things you can say to the Lord, but no way, Lord, isn't one of them. And somebody pointed out to me that, well, it was probably just Peter's heart for the Lord and his compassion toward the Lord that caused him to say, there's no way that can never happen to you, Lord. Well, that may be true. Peter's heart might have been in the right place. His 
heart for the Lord, yes, but he wasn't listening to the Lord. Because Jesus was saying, I must go to Jerusalem. I must be handed over. I must die. I will rise again, you see. And, and so whenever Peter says, no way, and having heard the Lord, well, somebody else pointed out in between the services last week that Peter never really did get this, not till after the resurrection. How do we know? They're in the garden when they come to arrest Jesus. Peter's still trying to defend him. He pulls the sword. He goes for it. Well, Jesus, Jesus came to suffer and die for our sins. He was on the Father's timetable and fulfilling the Father's plan. So when Peter says, no way, he was hearing from the enemy. And Jesus says so. Get behind me, Satan, he says. You're not savoring the things of God, but the things of men. Now, that caused me to consider, and I have to bring this up to you, because it really will help as we start to talk about denying ourselves and following him and taking up our cross and all the things this passage addresses. If it's possible, and more than possible, it's biblical, it happened, for Peter to hear from and speak for the Father. And on the very heels of that, to hear from and speak for the enemy, I'm thinking that can happen to us. That it's possible for me to proclaim the truth of God's word and the power of the Spirit and to the glory of the Father and then find myself in a situation where I don't like what I'm hearing or what I'm experiencing and begin to suggest or share things that are completely not the Lord. If it happened to Peter... It can happen to me. And if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. So we need to be careful. And, and so I, I sat down and I just wrote out a couple of things that I thought could be a help. If you're not sure where that thought's coming from, well, I would hold it for a moment then, you see, and just ask the Lord, is this you, Lord? Or, or, or is this me? Or is this the enemy? I'll give you a couple examples. God is forever affirming his love toward us and toward others. He loves us. He loves the lost. He loves. And so if our words aren't affirming, if they're discouraging or, 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 or taking people away from that reality, well, we're not speaking for the Father. The Lord is forever blessing, comforting directing, encouraging. That doesn't mean there's not a conviction of sin because in his direction, he directs us to turn from our sin and walk with him, to turn from our sin and trust in him. But there's always an encouragement to do so. There's never a discouragement like you're not going to be able to make it or measure up or, or, or last or, or, or stay the course. The enemy, on the other hand, he's all about accusation. And since I'm sure you never do this, I'll just use myself as the example. If I begin to have an accusing thought towards someone, I think I know more about them than I really do, or I can read their motivations. You know, we really can't. And when I begin to accuse someone mentally, or I go so far as to accuse them verbally, I'm speaking for the enemy, you see. Jesus is not the accuser of the brethren. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Jesus didn't come to, to blaspheme or to condemn. He, he came that the world might be through him saved. And so if my speech or language or even thoughts or thoughts of accusation or blasphemy or condemnation or distortion, gossip, hatred, insinuation, and I could have gone on and on with the list. I'm just saying, listen, we can hear from the Lord and speak for the Lord. And we can hear from the enemy and speak for the enemy. And we need to be cautious about what we say and to who we say it. Here's one of the things I've learned about me. You've probably already caught on to this too. I rather I speak rather quickly. I mean, I, I try to think through all I'm going to say, and I'm usually a few words ahead. I'm not always working, though. Sometimes the mouth gets engaged and the mind's just about to get in gear. And when that happens, like it does for you, sometimes I put my foot in my mouth and I say things I regret and wish I hadn't. Years ago, I asked my pastor about it, and he gave me some counsel. He said, Sam, in the multitude of words, sin is not wanting. Now, I didn't know that was a verse at that time. He was just quoting scripture to me. I thought he was just telling me, you talk too much. And, and that may be the case, too. But what he's saying is, if there's a lot of words, well, there's more opportunity to sin in the midst of that. And I listened to my pastor after all these years, and if you've heard Pastor Chuck... He speaks very deliberately and very slowly. 
In fact, his own son, when I was in Bible college, Chuck Jr., back in the days of cassettes when there was no auto reverse, some of you are like, what? Cassettes? What's that? And auto reverse, I mean, but, but it's like there, before CDs, cassettes, before auto reverse, man, you had to get up and turn the cassette over. And Pastor Chuck would sometimes pause so long and already talking so slowly that he'd pause and you'd get up to go turn over the cassette and he'd start talking again. <laughs> it's probably where they got the idea for the reversing cassette, you know? It's like, hey, there's an idea. We could. But anyway, my point is this. If you, like me, speak sometimes before you think, and believe me, you get me on my best behavior. I have thought through this. I've prayed over it. I've written an outline. I've studied it. I'm doing my best to communicate it. But, hey, just like anybody else, when I'm just confronted with a situa situation or even a situation, <laughs> when that happens to me, sometimes my response is inappropriate, ungodly, or even, well, it, it, it can be even worse. It, it could be me speaking for the enemy or the language of the enemy. Well, in any case, how does that relate to what happens here? Jesus had relayed to them the necessity of the cross. He was saying, I have to go up. I have to be turned over. And he will say this again in chapter 17. He'll say it again further into the, the uh, gospel of Matthew. All of the gospel writers tell us that he told his disciples over and over. That tells me he knew they weren't getting it. You know, you tell your kids something, they do it immediately or respond appropriately. You don't have to tell them again. But if you tell them and you don't get the hoped response, the desired response, well, you tell them again and you tell them again and you tell them again. And that's what Jesus had to do with these disciples. I think that's what he has to do sometimes with us as well. So Jesus says, I must go up to Jerusalem. I must be handed over. I must here, die, later, be crucified. He points them to the reality of the cross. And then he says, and I will be raised again the third day. Now, Jesus is telling us, if we desire to follow after him, to come after him, to be his disciples in essence, he says three things have to take place. He says in verse 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. To deny myself simply means that I am no longer on the throne of my own life. Now Jesus is ruling and reigning, not just philosophically, but in reality. It means I've given him the reins and the throne of my life. If we were driving along and the Lord came alongside and said, man, I love you, Sam, and I died for you, and I want you to have life eternal and life abundant. And I said, Lord, all right, I give you my life. He'd say, okay, move over. And I'd go, what are you talking Hey, I want to drive. And that's truly what the Lord does. When we give him our life, he takes the wheel and he begins to drive. Why? He knows where he's taking us, you see. And I find for me personally, maybe for you, certainly for me, from time to time, I like to get back behind the wheel. I like to just control my life for a few hours. And he's like, it wasn't going so good when you did it before, was it? And I'm like, well, no, but I'm a lot smarter now. And he's like, no, you're not. You, you're only doing better because I'm driving. But I'm right here, so close to that steering wheel. Yes, but let me drive and we'll get where we're going. And we'll get there a lot safer and, and a lot quicker. Well, in any case, to, to let him rule, to let him reign, it means I've got to first deny myself. Now, if I'm denying myself, that means I actually can obey some of his commandments. Like, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. It's fundamental to what it means to be a Christian, that we love him with all that's in us. And here's what I've learned in the years of walking with and growing in the Lord is that, that all that he desires from me, well, I was already doing it. I just wasn't doing it to him or as unto him. I've always loved with all that's in me. The problem was I loved me with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. And my neighbor, well, maybe, but not before me. And he's saying, no, for him to rule and reign, for me to follow, for me to 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 Go his way. I have to first deny myself. 
That means I'm going to love him now with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my strength, with all that's in me, heart and mind and soul and strength, and that I'm going to love others as I love myself. It's interesting that we often hear in our culture, you can't love others till you love yourself, or you can't love others until you love yourself more. That's never what you find in Scripture. The Bible would suggest we don't love others because we're too busy loving ourselves. And then what we need to do is learn to put others first. Why? That's what Jesus did, you see. He says, here's step one in a three-part step or three-part program or whatever you want to call it. If you prefer a program, hey, have a program. But it's deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. What does it mean to take up my cross? Well, we have to look at it first contextually. What did it mean to them? You got to know that they were baffled by this statement because in their day, the cross only had one meaning. It was the means of a torturous, horrendous, shameful, painful death. Nobody thinking of the cross would have any thoughts like we have because, well, they didn't have crosses on steeples and they didn't have crosses on little chains around people's neck. No, the cross was a means of execution and it was a means of executing the worst criminals of the day. And so when Jesus says you need to take up your cross, they had to think, well, I wonder what he means by that. What do you think he's getting at? You know what he meant by it? Literally, some of them were going to have to take up their cross and follow him. Peter himself, who suggested no cross for you, wasn't about to say, well, no cross for me, because he really didn't believe Jesus was telling him he was going to have to go to the cross. But tradition tells us that Peter did, in fact, die on a cross, that he was crucified. So for at least Peter and a couple of these disciples, Jesus was speaking absolutely literally. Now, he wasn't telling all of them, though, you're all going to have to die on a cross. He's saying you're going to have to deny yourself and take up your cross. Now, what was the purpose of the cross? Well, for Rome... As I already mentioned, it was a means of execution, but it was also a perfect picture of submission. That's why they had the criminals carry their own crosses. It was a sign to those prior to being crucified publicly and shamefully. It was a sign that they were now submitted to the government they had rebelled against. And if you rebelled against Rome, they said, you're going to carry that cross and then you're going to be crucified on that cross. And when you bore the cross and you were nailed to it, you were showing your submission now to those that you had rebelled against. So Jesus says, hey, take up your cross. It's a sign of your submission, a sign of your willingness to die to self and live for him, to die to self and live for others. And it's a perfect picture of both. Now, Paul will later say, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Paul will say, I die daily. He fully got this. He was willing to die if necessary. In fact, looking forward to it, I believe. He says at one point, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, only a Christian can say that. For if to live is anything but Christ for you, well, die will not be gain. It will be loss of all you have, all you've done. But listen, if you're a Christian and you're living for Christ Jesus, when you die, you're going to be with Jesus. And as we read and will read again at the end of our chapter, he says there'll be rewards. The ultimate evidence of his grace. He says, look at You can't do anything without me. And we're like, well, give us a chance. And like, you've been trying. Let me work through you. And and he says, he's the vine. We're the branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So then we submit to him and he begins to use us and and bless us. And, And then in the end, he rewards us as if, hey, that was good job. Well done, you know. But it was him working in us and through us to accomplish his good pleasure. So... Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. It's not just identifying with Jesus and on the cross, but living as he did, laying down our life practically for the needs of others. That's why we have to deny ourselves first. If I'm about my ambitions and my goals and my desires and my plans and, 
And the Lord says, well, what about my desires and my ambitions and my goals and my plans? They're so much better for you and it's, they're better for others. Yeah, but Lord, I got to accomplish this and this means something. Does it? I, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't be about the business we're about. We're supposed to work, we're supposed to provide, we're supposed to care, we're supposed to work and provide so we have enough to help people who are more needy than we are. But in the midst of that, we got to be asking that question, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to accomplish? Well, this whole idea of denying self, it doesn't come natural. I think you know that. It's not natural to me. It won't be natural to you. To deny yourself is a supernatural response to a command of God. He says, do it, and you're like, well, there's nothing in me that cries yes, you know. My flesh doesn't say, yeah, denial, let's go, you know. No, my flesh says, what? No way. And that's the great problem is, is I struggle on three fronts when I, I hear him say, deny yourself or take up your cross. Follow me. My flesh recoils against the idea of denying myself. Temptation, it's a real problem. The enemy comes and says, man, you don't have to deny yourself. You don't have to be a fanatic. You believe in Jesus. You've trusted in him. You're a Christian. You're going to heaven. And the Lord's saying, yeah, but, but it's not about you any more than is it? It's about others. That's why we got to love him and love others because we are going to heaven. We're not denying ourselves and taking up our cross so we can get to heaven. It's so that others can get there. See, Jesus bore his cross for others, for us. And when we bear our cross, it's not like, well, this is my cross to bear. No, we're bearing it for others. It's whatever he's leading us in and guiding us in and directing us in. So my flesh has a problem with it, and the enemy suggests it's absolutely unnecessary. And then there's the world. You know, the world mocks the cross. And even though it is on all the steeples and lots of people wear it, I see a lot of people wearing it and I hear things coming out of their mouths and I watch a couple of ward shows and I'm like, man, I don't think they really get the meaning of the cross. But here's the thing. Paul tells us why. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, he says. But to us who are being saved, hey, it's the power of God to salvation. It's a part of that wonderful gospel. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And so if for you, maybe the cross, you hear about it and you're like, I've heard it, I've heard it, I've heard it, the cross, the cross, the cross. Listen, it doesn't matter how many times you've heard it. It only matters if you believe it. And it really matters if you believe it. And here's why. In the first century... When the disciples began to preach, hey, our Lord, our Savior, the Messiah, uh, the Christ, he died on the cross for you. Some would have found that an absurdity. They would have laughed and mocked at the idea. And that's why he says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But we really can't get in their skin and understand how they felt and why they were mocking without just updating the whole thing. And I owe all this to Gail Irwin, who first suggested to us that if today our Lord had come and died, he wouldn't have died on a cross, would he? No, he would have died, say, in the electric chair. And would have changed everything, because then we'd go about saying, hey, my best friend just died for you in the electric chair. And if you'll deny yourself and take up your electric chair and follow him, well, yeah, you know why you you chuckle? Because it sounds absurd. It sounds funny. Well, how how could anybody dying in an electric chair atone for my sin? How can that make any difference in my situation? Well, it makes a difference because that's what he came to do. And that's what the Bible says he did, in fact. Many find that their courage fails when they contemplate the idea of totally giving their lives over to Jesus and what that might mean. Now, we're told that a faithful man will abound with blessings, but we also know the persecution and trials that await us. Now, we can be comforted in this fear, however, when we read what the Apostle Paul learned about it. In Philippians 4.11, he says, For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know what it means to be humbled, and I know what it means to be filled. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me.
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.